Hi, I'm Mort Cooper, your host on Change Your Voice, Change Your Life. In studio with me is uh, Dr. John Curtis, syndicated uh, national uh, writer, and he came up with the title of today's program, which is? Killing the Cure. Killing the Cure. What does that mean, Dr. Curtis? Well, you, you, in the history of medicine, you, you know, of course, that mm -hmm. people have died. Uh, there's been mass plagues throughout history, and the purpose of medicine is really to find a cure. The purpose of the, the whole field is to really find people who are mm -hmm. the intelligence and mm -hmm. the innovation to come up with cures for various mm -hmm. conditions. Mm -hmm. Did you know that in 1345 when the plague was raging and 25 million people in Western Europe, just in Western Europe, were dead from the Black Plague, 1345, the French king called his three leading physicians to him. You know what the story is? Do you want to tell it or you want me to tell no, it? No, I'd like to hear it from you. He called the three leading physicians to his uh, side and asked them what the cause of the Black Plague is. The three leading physicians said, my liege, may we retire and consult? Yes, you may. They came back, and do you know what they told them, what the cause of the Black Plague that killed 25 million people in Western Europe alone? This is 1345, the medical people. What did they tell them? Well, what did they tell them? That the stars were coming together in the galaxy, my lord. That was the cause of the Black Plague. They massacred a number of Jews. Jews have always been a prime time for people who don't understand what's going on. And so it was only until the beginning of the 20th century, the, tw the beginning of the 20th century, that two physicians in the Louis Pasteur Institute in Paris figured out it was the rats that did it. Now, how long does it take from 1345 to almost 1900? How many years is that? It's 550? Six, six, 600, and, 600 and something years. Is it 650? Yeah. Or 550? 550 to the beginning of the, uh, the 20th century, 1900, just the beginning of 1900. Well, that's quite a paradigm shift. Mm -hmm. That's that's 550 years it took the medical There's people. There's still people that believe in astrology. They read mm -hmm. those charts every day in the paper. That's fine. Maybe that's what will cure spasmodic dysphonia is astrology. Tell us what spasmodic dysphonia is. Well, that's when your voice is strangled, mm -hmm. and it's a, it's, a, it's a problem. And I, I read a piece by Scott Dilbert, mm -hmm. uh, which was interesting. He said that it was a very rare condition. Is that your experience? No, it's not rare. Uh, Scotty uh, um, has given up the right of privacy. He has a blog out. I work with him. He said I had a, a significant. Uh, he says I had a significant improvement. Do people know who life Scott Adams by is? What I, did for I don't think people even know who he is. Why don't you tell them who Scott Adams is? You tell them. He's the creator of the the, the Dilbert cartoon, mm -hmm. and he was actually in his uh, statement that he made. And that was in the ARP magazine, A A R A R P. Yeah. And do you know that ARP, as an organization, is heavily funded by the drug industry? I don't know if you knew that. No, I didn't know that. Yeah. Does that come as a big shock to you? It's a, it's Why does that surprise you? Well, I, do you think I, elderly people? Do you know that elderly people are the largest consumers for drugs? Mm -hmm. well, you know why? No, why? Because elderly people develop chronic diseases, mm -hmm. and chronic diseases, by definition, require chronic treatment. That's mm -hmm. frequent treatment. Mm -hmm. Do you know that chronic treatment is what keeps drug companies in business? Yes, I understand that a cure would kill them. A cures are all. killing the cure. Yeah. If you, if you have a cure. No, they kill the cure and they kill also kill the messenger. Yeah. Are the you looking messenger at me as with the messenger? Yes, I'm the, importing cures as Yes, I, I, I know that. It's a chronic condition for life four to ten times a year. You get Botox shots four to ten times a year. Uh, one to two, three, four thousand dollars a Botox shot. Take seconds uh, for experienced uh, your nose and throat doctors to do it. So it's a full employment, lifetime annuity. It's a very, very rewarding field. But, but think about it. Killing the cure is also involved in killing the messenger. But it's also involved, they, it's more than killing the cure, is killing the messenger eventually, mm -hmm. who has the cure. But it's also killing the message. Mm -hmm. The message is a, you know what the message is? The message is a, is a theoretical concept that has to do with there's hope. Mm -hmm. 
there's really something that can help somebody. Mm -hmm. So that message has to be destroyed, mm -hmm. and they do it in different ways. Now, Dilbert mm -hmm. or Scott Adams mm -hmm. in that message is basically saying this is a rare condition and that he found his own cure mm -hmm. by engaging in nursery rhymes. He's not cured. Does that surprise you that he found his, uh, that he's saying in no, there? No, that's a, that's a you, if you put your finger in your pocket and you, you manipulate your finger, you can distract yourself. That was used for stutterers. And any distraction, whether you have spasmodic dysphonia or other problems such as that, if you distract yourself, then you can have a normal voice. Did you know that? Uh, I did know that. And, mm -hmm. and do, you, do you know that many major drug studies, mm -hmm. when they are testing and doing double-blind studies, mm -hmm. so let's say they're using placebos mm -hmm. and they're also using uh, w whatever uh, treatments they're using, do you realize that when you use a treatment, any treatment, on a mm -hmm. set of symptoms, there will automatically be a, an effect mm -hmm. as a consequence of using the, the, the mm -hmm. treatment, regardless of what it is. Mm -hmm. So let's say you have a cardiovascular symptom mm -hmm. and you use a drug that you think has a cardiovascular effect. You could use a drug that treats depression mm -hmm. and, pro and get a, gain a benefit just by the virtue you're adding something. Mm -hmm. A cardiovascular benefit will be weighed out and mm -hmm. measured and reported mm -hmm. in the data. Mm -hmm. So when Dilbert says he does the distraction technique, you could I, I hit He's somebody. He's doing, doing nursery rhymes. Nursery rhymes. Anything distracting, That's I, what I'm I talking. told him. Yeah. He gives up the right of privacy. He w uh, was a patient of mine. He said a significant improvement and life change by what I did. It's all natural by what I did. But don't you find it odd that when he gave you a statement, mm -hmm. uh, Scott Adams, mm -hmm. a very generous statement, mm -hmm. saying, touting, really, the, the work that he did in your office, mm -hmm. and now when he's speaking to, to an audience on ARP, which is heavily funded by the drug industry, mm -hmm. he's saying that what helped him with his spasmodic dysphonia <laughs> were engaging in nursery rhymes. Now, that, if you think there's about the- There's a disconnect the, there the, there's the, well, Where's the dislocation here? Uh, he doesn't Why did he forget about being in your office? Well, he also uh, did not report the fact that he had Botox when he gave it up. Uh, Botox is botulinum toxin, a uh, bow for botulinum, and tox for toxin. Well, they say it's a bee sting. It is not a bee sting. They have come out now <laughs> with a study indicating it's not a bee sting, although uh, in a uh, video by Michael Rolnick for the NSD, National Spasmodic Dysphonic Association, which is funded by Allegan, the maker of Botox, they're well-intentioned, they're humane and compassionate, uh, they said it's a bee sting. It turns out in the study that it's not a bee sting. Well, they, they put a needle study. in the patient's neck. I think mm -hmm. it could be a very... It, it can be a rather unappealing experience. It is, apparently, too. I think they'd lie them on a table. Yeah. They drape them with, with a white sheet, mm -hmm. basically. They anesthetize the area, mm -hmm. you know, with a needle. Mm -hmm. and, and then they insert the needle deep into the, the vocal cords, mm -hmm. and they inject. Now, they claim that they have complete pinpoint accuracy mm -hmm. and scientific precision mm -hmm. with which they do this. I've seen a video mm -hmm. by the National Spasmodic Dysphonia Association. I saw it too. Yeah. And they say that these are scientists who are engaged and busy engaged in their work. Is yeah. that true? Uh, it's not what the patients are telling me about their <laughs> Botox shot being a bee sting. And we had one uh, gentleman, a minister, who was at uh, a national, a well-known medical center who said that uh, it was, uh, in a sense, horrendous as to what he, uh, was done to him in giving him the Botox shot. So that's, uh, there's a lot of... Uh, but sometimes uh, with pain, you know, in, in the medical field, they will tell you with pain comes gain. Now, uh -huh. the question is, is it worth the bee sting or the, the experience of having the needle inserted in the neck, an injection with Botox? Does it work? Is it effective? The, the docs and the medics, even the, the drug company, Allergan Inc., mm -hmm. the maker of Botox, they, they claim this is 99% effective. Is, is that your experience with patients? Apparently, there's a statement by Disraeli, or it may be um, Mark Twain, and the statement is nobody knows who made that statement per se. Uh, there are lies, damn lies, and statistics. Uh, my experience is that a figure, if it's known and said, which is told to me by patients whom I see who have been Botox, that it's 99% effective, is off the wall. And uh, they have, uh, in the field, I understand now, narrowed it down to it's less and less than the 99% figure because that is, from my experience, not real. Well, you've actually had patients come and tell you the number of Botox shots they've had, and then whether or not they receive satisfactory results. No, well, there is a woman who had 45 or more Botox shots from the Mayo Clinic, and she never had one positive, one, one positive outcome, not one, in 15 years that she had the Botox shots from the Mayo Clinic. Then there's Tom, 
who had an approximate number of Botox shots covering seven years, and he never had one positive result. So there's something that is not holding up. There's but there are disconnect. some people that do that claim they do get positive yes, there, results. Yes, there are people. Like some of the people told you that they got uh, one uh, patient in particular mm. who went to some of the 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 best and the, the brightest. The creme de la creme. The best and the brightest, right? You can't get better. This is the, the New York the, Chicago group. Yes. And they, they went to the finest uh, otolaryngologist, final ENT men that, mm. that the money can buy. Mm. And how many, what was the uh, ratio? Neurologist. A neurologist. And uh, so what was their Tom record? is the president of a Fortune 500 company. And he gave up Botox because he had one positive result, the first one, out of 17 Botox shots covering a period of four years. And he was very kind to uh, allow me to use his uh, story on a DVD. Uh, it's a two-hour DVD. And also, there's a book, Curing Hopeless Voices, which you can download from my website telling you the story of what's going on about Botox for spasmodic dysphonia and for surgery. For well, the, the uh, book is really about killing the cure. Yes. Because when you think about it, mm -hmm. the, the story is like the inadvertent discovery of the cure, mm -hmm. the application of the treatment that you discovered, mm -hmm. and then uh, in, I, I think it sort of reminds me of what the U.S. said that we were going to expect when we arrived in Iraq. We Weapons were, of mass destruction. No, no. When they arrived on the shores mm -hmm. in the southern oh, greeting part, and love they, they were supposed to get love. flowers, honey, uh -huh. uh, greeting. And, and you know what was waiting for them? Kalashnikovs, that's AK-47s, rocket-propelled grenades, <laughs> and mass destruction. I mean, the, the soldiers told me, they, they had an interview with a guy. Mm -hmm. He was in... in uh, Ramstein, mm. he was in Germany, mm. he's sitting in a hospital bed with one of his legs blown off, mm. and he was saying, they told us we were going to be embraced with love. Uh, do you they know, shot at us. Did you ever read, folks, uh, reading is not in for too many, but hopefully uh, there are those who will read and understand. There was a book called The Enemy of the People by Ibsen, and it's, you know what the story is? No, what, what well, is the story of a, a doctor in town that finds the wells in town are polluted. And this is a spa where people come to improve their health. And he says, we have to tell the public that the wells are polluted. And so they ruin him. This is a good doctor. And you know the story that if you woe unto him who tries to undo the woes of society, I wrote that. I have reported cures of the so-called hopeless voice problem and been doing it for over 35 years and printed in the top uh, journals in the uh, uh, handbook of uh, speech pathology and audiology. It's, it was one of the biggest uh, um, handbooks. And I talked about... Was that Lee Travis's Lee part? Travis, right. And then I reported that in my uh, textbook and I reported it in peer review in 1980, cures and so forth. I thought I'd be welcome with open Wasn't arms. Wasn't Lee Travis one of the, me the founding members of the one American speech? One of the five speech founders hearing? members, yeah. Well, he, he, he's a big name in the field. He said, Why yeah. would he include your work in his handbook? He said in writing, I'm the best in the business in my field. But why would a man who's a luminary, a pioneer, I mean mm -hmm. literally one of the great celebrities of the mm -hmm. field, uh, tout the success but now you know, you have people who are gunning for you. <laughs> well, Lee Travis is dead, and the people who supported me are gone. But why are you being, why are they gunning for you right now? What have you done other than find a cure and try to help people? A cure of spasmodic dysphonia is a dirty word, as you said. You, you, you are the one that's guilty of coming up with that. Well, it is, it is a dirty word, because uh, what does a cure mean to the medical profession right now who has a chronic treatment in the name of Botox? They're making one two, three, four thousand dollars a Botox shot. They're doing Botox shots according to Dr. Uh, Gerald Burke, chairman of the UCLA Medical Center, um, four to ten times a year. And there are serious side effects he has, he has written. Dr. Burke himself knows I have a, uh, the cures of spasmodic dysphonia because he referred Gail Pace to me. And let's, if we have time, can we show uh, part of the uh, video, the DVD, uh, that shows cures, and if we run out of time, we can just cut that and come back to studio. Let's run it. Can we? We'll show cures. And I took a round of antibiotics, and then they put me on a stronger antibiotic, and I took that. And it's, I've, I began to feel good, but the voice 
that's been a mess ever since. I'm commissioned sales at Sears, and that's my livelihood, is my voice. I got so depressed just not being able to talk that it definitely affected my life. This voice was coming out. I just, you know, I said, God damn it. Within a month of uh, therapy with Dr. Cooper, I was using my voice again to the extent that I could go out on interviews and auditions and shortly thereafter actually worked. You can hear the obstructions starting to obstruct now, I think. This is the new voice. There is that aspect of lightening up, but there also is an aspect of having the correct pressurization. And he said, mm -mm, I don't want you to talk in that little girl's voice anymore. You talk in your regular voice. <laughs> I said, but when I talk in my regular voice, you can't understand what I'm saying. I had a strangled voice. It was very difficult to speak. Uh, when I did speak, it, um, was, it sounded strangled. Before I had, learned, had worked into the position of employment director, manager of employment, and he continued to make overtures. Day to pick her up before too late and take her home. Do I feel that I'm likely to go back to it? No, I don't. And, and he says, well, Ron, I'll give you three options, too. He says, well, you can continue coming here for shots. Um, you can call that doctor in California to schedule a surgery, if you'd like. And then he goes, oh, oh yeah, by the way, Ron, uh, there's also this other guy. Go to his website, and he wrote down his name, thevoicedoctor.com, uh, and handed it to him. And he says, check out this guy. He says he has a cure. And uh, so I found on the dystonia page that something that plagued people with focal dystonia was very often spasmodic dysphonia. And they called it, you know, multifocal dystonia. And I, as a patient who has experienced the fear mm -hmm. and agony of thinking that my voice is disappearing. It just got really bad lately. Uh, it chokes up. My voice chokes up. I can't breathe. I feel like I'm running out of air. I didn't think that it could be so simple, but it was. When the sunlight strikes raindrops in the air, they act like a prism and form a rainbow. When the sunlight strikes raindrops in the air, they act like a prism and form a rainbow. Gradually through a period of a year, it kept getting progressively worse where, where um, within a matter of days it would occur. This is the patient's recovered voice. And then I went and start talking to my boss, and at the end of like a sentence, I could it would start dropping, and he'd say, "What's wrong with what's wrong with your voice?" And I'd say, "I don't know." I thought, "What's happened? What have, what have I done to myself?" I know no one out there has this horrible problem I've got, but I found out there's an awful lot of people walking around out there in this world that have the spastic dysphonia. And they say it's because some. Um motor signal from the brain is overamped and it tightens up the vocal cords. It's pretty tragic, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Pretty tragic sound and it's quite different now. The last time um, he injected me with um, half a unit each in Botox, I completely lost my voice for six weeks. I was incapacitated. It was a complete roller coaster going through that, mm. you know, but that's the only treatment that they told me was available and that I would be getting these injections for the rest of my life. Couldn't think of any name, and my sister and I were joking around about how many people call the rabbit's caught tail. And I just said, oh, yeah, wouldn't that be funny if I called it Q tip? So we just called it Q tip. Can you talk with the rabbit again? Hi, Q tip. How are you? Do you want to hop around today? Um, are you thirsty? Why did you bite my shoe? Do you realize you change your voice when you talk to the rabbit? Yes. I talked higher. Who diagnosed it? Um, Scripps, Scripps Hospital in La Jolla. Probably about, probably about a year and a half ago. Mm, they told me that it was neurological and I was born with it. Other than the one time from Bryn where I had six months good voice, nothing. I believe that um, spasmodic dysphonia is curable. According to legend, a boiling pot of gold at one end. People look, but no one ever finds it. 
I've been here for the past 10 days trying to find a job, uh, teaching position for the next academic year. They didn't know what to do because they couldn't get me out of it. So eventually I went to other doctors who told me I had spasmodic dysphonia. Trying to get help is very difficult because you can't communicate the problem or just your trials. They want you to go to psychiatrists. And how are you supposed to go to psychiatrists when you can't speak? And then he said, well, how long ago did you see Dr. Cooper? And I went, oh, my God, it's been six years. It'll be six years in June. Well, as I go through the day, uh, even right now, I, I'm tending to raise my voice and go into the upper register. Do you remember that voice? I remember it. Did you like it? <laughs> I didn't like it then. didn't like it now. That's to help. And after a while, I eat my voice. Not 100%, but much better than it had been. And after about two years, it started to, again, go got worse and worse. I hope that by sharing, others too will find new hope for a, a life that allows them that greatest gift that God has given us, the gift that makes us human, that gift we call communication. We're back in studio right now, and we have, uh, we've been discussing uh, the killing these the cure. cures of spasmodic yeah. dysphonia. Yeah, we're, we're, we've been discussing how the, 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 everybody wants to kill the cure. They want to kill the doctor who's providing the cure, and they certainly want to kill, kill the message of the cure that is mm -hmm. out there for patients that would like to improve their voices. It's a, it's, a, it's a very simple program, isn't it? I mean, what you invented was nothing really that complex. No, it's very simple. But you're touching a nerve. When you cure, when you tell somebody they're talking wrong, you're changing their personality, you're changing their self-perception, and they fight like all heck not to do it. Now, the change is very simple. The National Spasmodic Dysphonic Association had a discussion on that chat room and saying, Cooper is using pitch to change, and it can impede your health. Don't change your pitch. Well, pitch is a simple modality. They talk all the way down here, and I put them up in the face. It's very simple. So they're arguing against a change of pitch. The, the medical society is making it very complicated as to how to treat spasmodic dysphonia. Speech therapy has never reported a single cure, never. And they don't want to use pitch. Pitch is too simple. Do, do you think that spasmodic dysphonia, I know this sounds like a simple question, uh, is a, in fact a neurological disease? No, absolutely not. It cannot be. I cannot change a neurological problem. That's what I'm doing. <laughs> According to the medical society and all academia and the Allegan, the maker of Botox, uh, I cannot do that. They claim that this is a dystonia, focal laryngeal dystonia. Mm -hmm. Sp in fact, some, some doctors now are using the term spasmodic dystonia. Right. Gerald Burke used it. We had Reverend, Jane, uh, Reverend uh, Henry Sellers who said that's what he heard when uh, he was at UCLA diagnosed by uh, Dr. Gerald Burke, who's a wonderful, compassionate, humane person. Um, and he referred because he, he wanted... Uh, well, dystonias are neuromuscular and diseases. And Henry Sellers was cured of spasmodic now, do you, dysphonia. Do you, th do you have specialized training in curing neuromuscular disease? No. Do you have specialized training in curing psychiatric or mental illness? No. Do you have specialized training in, in treating a uh, biochemical imbalances? No. Okay, then how are you able to, to treat a, um, cure. A, a dystonia, cure. a neurological, because it's not neuromuscular a dystonia, disease? And it's not a neuromuscular problem. It can't be. That's the point I make. Well, why, does, why do the, does the medical community treat this condition with a neurotoxin? Because they're, they're, they're misinterpreting a study done in 1960 by Roe, Brumlick, and Moore saying that uh, it's belie it suggested, not, not documented, that this condition must be neurological because for 90 years prior to that, psychiatric care never reported a single cure of this condition, dating back to Traub in 1871. And psychiatric care is still used greatly in this country, but they still doesn't, they don't have one single cure ever, nor do those who 
uh, propose and believe that it's neurological. Do you, do you find it of, of any interest at all that the leading researcher in your field, her name is Do Dr. Christy Ludlow with the mm. National Institutes of Health, mm. insists that you prov provide phase one, phase two, and phase three trials for your treatment, but she doesn't... Before the FDA. Yeah, for the FDA. But she doesn't insist mm -hmm. that the very study on which the field changed from a psychiatric illness for spasmodic dysphonia to a neurological disease, neuromuscular mm -hmm. disease. Which they never found. Was, was they only never with, found any neurological I believe problem. it was only that study with eight subjects. Ten. Ten. Mm -hmm. A completely unacceptable amount mm -hmm. of subjects on which to draw any inference mm -hmm. because of the randomness of the effect of only having eight patients mm -hmm. from which to draw any conclusions. Why do they insist that you produce phase one, phase two, and phase three, but they don't insist that the study that they're using in order to treat people with Botox that is, 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 a, is a study that cannot have any scientific validity to it? It's one-sided. Arguments are one-sided. <laughs> I, I can't get arrested. I couldn't get into a medical meeting today with a newsie. <laughs> I guess you're, you're bringing... And there is no... I don't need phase one, phase two, and phase three, and I told uh, um, the good lady, Christy uh, Ludlow, she's very humane, very c compassionate, and well-intentioned. Um, there is no need for phase one, phase two, and phase three before the FDA because this is not a problem of neurological or medical cause, and it's a cause by misuse of the speaking voice, and I can help that, and I can cure it, and I report ongoing cures of this condition. You just saw the uh, uh, seven-and-a-half-minute uh, 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 before and after cures of spasmodic dysphonia. I have a two-hour uh, DVD, and for those who have spasmodic dysphonia, you're welcome to it. It's free. Just call my office. Well, the medical community seems to be objecting to the word cure. Why is cure a dirty word it's, in the field? It's a, a terrifying term because they're treating the condition chronically for life, one, two, three, four thousand dollars a Botox shot, four to ten times a year uh, for life. Uh, uh, that's uh, that's a lifetime that the, annuity and it's a full employment act isn't for that 200 the of the, the people. Goal? 200 of the 14,300 ear, nose, and throat, throat doctors, only 200 are giving the Botox shot. Isn't that the goal of the history of medicine is to come up with cures of various conditions? Well, it took a little time, 550 years before the medics decided and figured out by two uh, fine physicians in the Pasteur Institute in about 1899 that uh, the rats were killing uh, um, those with uh, the Black Plague. Do you know that I sat in front of a gentleman, this was a few years ago, and I interviewed him. Mm -hmm. This was in Winfield, Kansas, about 150 miles north of Oklahoma mm -hmm. City. The sleepy tree-lined, willow tree, uh, tree street, mm -hmm. little house on his porch. He was sitting in a wheelchair, and he told me his story of how he got into the wheelchair. Mm -hmm. And But he developed a cure for cancer. Mm -hmm. And you know what happened to him? A big mistake. They poisoned him and they put him in jail. Well, those stories are a <laughs> dime a dozen, and uh, I don't know, uh, Steve uh, Gray <laughs> came in, and uh, Steve, what, what are you telling me? It's time to go? <laughs> I, I think maybe the show is over with. Yes, I don't know. Steve, <laughs> is the time for us to go? Uh, how much time do we have? I hear the music in the background. Yeah, okay. <laughs> if we have music, then it's that time to go. That means that I you, think the show's Dr. Krieger has wound the show okay. down. Thank you for joining us. Bye-bye. I don't know if you... <laughs>